it's you cool to looking, but it's kind of hot out there. Come on, even, so, ladies. you're going to get a little air conditioning right break here. here. Uh, it's even cooler downstairs, believe it or not. But uh, it'll be nice. Hopefully, give you. A, oh, we got some more. Give you a, a, a little break from the tremendous heat that's out there. So, my name is uh, Roger Hooker. I'm a retired master sergeant. Is that the show? Come on, come on. Don't be so <laughs> dead here. Liven us up. Let's make this a little enjoyable. Anyway, I'm a retired master sergeant. I was the historian here in the mid '80s. Uh, with the missile wing, and then I came back in the late 90s or early 90s and became the B2 historian. And last five years of my job, I also ran Oscar One, so uh, I know how much of a pain in the rear it is to get volunteers. So uh, Dave uh, uh, asked me, the guy who runs this now, uh, asked me to come out and lift this man out of my cage every once in a while. Right? Right. Right. We, we both get out of our cages once in a while, so. so I'll jump in a little bit. My name is Marty Harrison, and I'm a retired Air Force Major, and I was a crew member in both Titan, Miniman, and Ground Launch Cruise Missiles. I served in Tucson, Arizona as a crew commander. I was here in the 508 as a crew commander. Uh, I was an operations officer. I was an instructor, and I spent time in England. So I got a lot of missile experience, and we're going to kind of let Roger jump in on this tour. Okay, okay. so um, we got a couple of rules, especially when we go downstairs. We ask that you don't touch anything, okay? It's really important. You're gonna go back down, step you going when you would go downstairs, it's kinda of like stepping back in the time. We can't get parts for it anymore. If it breaks, it's gone forever. And we want every American to come out here and enjoy this and see what these missile folks actually did throughout the uh, the, the Cold War. So, okay, take all the pictures you want, ask all the questions you want. Just and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about safety when we get downstairs. So oh sure. Okay, everybody in the Air Force has got a nickname, mine's Hook. If you have a question, you yell, hey, Hook, or hit me upside the head or something like that, and I'll answer uh, If I don't know the answer, I can get a real good song and dance. Okay, all right. So we're going to start off a little bit about the missile field, how it was, uh, uh, how, it, uh, how it operated, uh, all the missile silos, how they built this site, and how they finally got rid of it. So this was a map of our missile field, 351st Strategic Missile Wing, owned it and operated it, and had three squadrons assigned. The red was the 5-8th, the 5-9th here in the blue, and the green was the 5-10th. Each squadron was then further subdivided down into five flights, and each flight consisted of a number one, or a building like this, and I'll refer to this as the command center, a number one, and each number one controlled 10 missiles. Okay, the missiles weren't on base, or they weren't right next door. You won't see any missiles today, any missile silos. They were all spread out about three to five miles away. That way, if the Russians decided to attack, they'd have to try and get each one independently. But it was about three to five miles away. This whole area covered about 10,000 square miles. Okay. And it should have been even larger because back in the 60s, when they were figuring out where all this stuff was going to go, they wanted to put the five tents down here. They wanted a free zone around the base, about a 50 mile free zone. They looked and found, among other things, the Lake of the Ozarks is down in this part of Missouri. Anybody, y'all from Missouri, y'all know about Lake of the Ozarks? Okay. And, and down there. And so they had to back up and regroup. And they looked and looked and looked. And the only other area that was suitable was that 50 mile free zone. So they decided to put the five tents in there. And they said, since we made white men a target, we might as well really make it a target. And they put one of the command centers here on base, Oscar One. As a result, Oscar is the only one in the world that was actually on a, physically on an active Air Force base anywhere in the world. So, it's really cool. And like I said, they're about three to five miles away from each other. The crews downstairs would talk to, talk to, and monitor the missiles through an extensive underground cable system called, where'd where go? Oh, here, Hicks. Part of the underside cable system. Yeah, they tell me that today they could replace all this with one strand of fiber optics, okay? But this was back in the early 60s, and they uh, laid about 1,770 miles of this stuff. In fact, if you look at this map over here, you can see all the black heavy lines. That's where that cable ran, okay? It allowed Charlie One crew to talk to their missiles. But within each squadron, this is really important, within each squadron, they were also interconnected. That white, if Charlie One got destroyed, the Bravo crew 
they launched their missiles, they could turn around and take over Charlie's. So, in theory, one crew could launch 50. They didn't like things like that. It's a lot of power, but if, if uh, they needed to, that's, they had that capability. And this was buried about four, anywhere from four to five feet down. On occasion, it would rise up a little for, uh, closer. And uh, Farmer Brown would be out plowing his field to whack one of these things. Okay, it was pressurized, so they knew almost exactly where that leak was. Farmer Brown didn't pay any attention to it, and he's plowing. And all of a sudden, a bunch of cops from the Air Force show up. <laughs> Farmer Brown goes, holy, you know what? What did I do? He accidentally whacked these things. And we kept track of them because if Russians were trying to tap into our missiles, they'd be worthless. So they keep a real close eye on these things. Okay? Uh, okay. Any questions about the missile field itself so far? Okay, everybody cool? Missile silo. This is what your typical missile silo looked like, okay? There was no people assigned to this. People here at the command center all the time, but the silo was totally uh, vacant. There's nobody out there. But they did have security sensors out there to pick up movement. Sometimes it was a cat, a dog, a rabbit. I heard sometimes a nuclear protester throw out a bird feed over the fence so a flock of birds would come in and set it off. But whatever it was, there were six cops up here. <coughs> and they were divided in two-person teams. Alarm went off. The crew noted it downstairs. Alarm went off. The uh, fire team, or the response team, security response team would rush out there and check it out. And it worked. It worked. They, they knew exactly what was going on. And I like to tell a little story about Michael Levin. Back in the late 80s, I think it was. They got an alarm. The crew of Mike 1 got an alarm. They sent their cops out there to check it out. And they found that some nuclear protesters had clipped a chain on the fence out there, hauled a jackhammer in there, and they were trying to jackhammer through that silo door, which happens to weigh about 110 tons, 110 tons. So they're out there jackhammering and having all sorts of fun. Cops get out there, stop them, hold them for the federal marshals. And then they, the really interesting part is they looked around and noticed there was a video crew outside the fence videotaping all of this stuff. And they looked even closer and there was a familiar celebrity out there, Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes, was videotaping. And they go up, excuse me, sir, can we help you? What exactly are you doing out here? And Mike said, you know what, guys? We just happened to be driving by on Highway 50. We saw some people on your missile site. We thought we'd videotape it for you for possible things. Anybody believe that? <laughs> no. No. By the way, those protesters went to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah one of them was a priest. Well, there was a priest and a couple of Yeah, the, the priest was in the mid-80s, yeah. 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 This one was a little later, but I was here when the priest got uh, got sent there. I think there were a couple of sisters with him, too. But yeah, they all they all were uh, guests of Uncle Sam for a little while. So Okay, but they had the sensors. Like I said, there was nobody out there, but they knew what was going on. Now, the site itself was about an acre or acre and a half of land. It had a large security fence around it. But the only thing you would really notice was a huge concrete pad in the middle. That pad was that silo door that the boys tried to uh, jackhammer through. The missile that was here was the Midway Two. It was a three-stage solid propellant single nuclear warhead on board. Had a range of about 5,500 miles and can launch until an impact on the Soviet Union took it about 20 minutes. And I found my picture on it and the first one. Missile folks got a real proud of that fact and they would paint things about that. And this was up at one of our northern units. They painted it on their blast door saying worldwide delivery in 30 minutes or less. We had a rather macabre sense of humor. Next door is free. <laughs> so they they uh, they did they did a real unique sense of humor. So, but all joking aside, I want you all to understand that once these things were launched, that was it. There was no oops button. There was no way to uh, say come back in a hole like a good little missile. We didn't mean to launch you. Uh, whenever they launched it, it was gone. So you're going to see downstairs there are a lot of fail safes that were built into the system to prevent an accidental or unauthorized launch. A lot of things had to happen to perfection before these things would uh, Was there a self-destruct? Nope. 
No self-destruct. No, nope, it's not no. like in the movies. Yep. Why not? Real simple. Yeah. If we had radio cap capability to self-destruct, somebody else could have done it for us. The only packages, only time we use self-destruct packages are launches from uh, Cape Canaveral and from Vandenberg that are test launches. And there is a self-destruct package that's commanded from the operations center. It's not on board, but it's commanded from on, on the ground. Okay. Question? Is, is that missile going outside? That's a mock-up. That's a model, but that's the real size. And, and the other thing about our missiles, they weren't painted white. <laughs> um, that one happens to be painted white for display purposes. Anybody know why you wouldn't paint a missile? White. White. Yeah. Paint cat. And if you paint a missile, it's gonna catch fire. What's that? When it catch fire? Too. No, carry that's weight. It cuts back on range. Anybody lift mm -hmm. up? Ever lift up a five gallon bucket of paint? Mm -hmm. That's twenty five pounds. You paint a missile, it takes away from its range. That's why they what put paint in this in right, the, uh, black. The the tank on the space shuttle. Yeah, 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 exactly. Now, before we head downstairs, Roger takes you downstairs. Anybody want to guess what this is? The warhead itself. Well, it's not the warhead, but it's close. Huh? Is it part of it? Well, yeah. It's the pointy end. It's called an RV shroud. Inside here would have been the weapon. And this was what protected it during flight and on reentry. Now, as Roger pointed out, our missile has a nice point on it. This one's nice and round. And that's because as part of reentry, it had burned off. The same material that was used on space shuttles, the blade of shield that burns off to protect it, because this is coming in this way. Now, the history behind this reentry vehicle is that it actually flew from a missile that was pulled here in Whiteman back in the mid to early 70s. It was pulled out of the 508 squadron, my squadron, and it was a test launch probably about 1973 or 74. It flew about 6,000 miles down the Pacific Test Range to the Kwajalein Atoll off the coast of Wake Island. The reentry vehicle dropped into the Kwajalein Atoll, but this shroud was shed, shed prior to that. And this thing floated around the Pacific for about two and a half years. It was recovered off the coast of Hawaii about 1975-ish, maybe 76. I'm not sure the exact date. But it had a serial number on the inside that identified it as a Whiteman launch. This was recovered by me, that's why I tell the story, and my deputy. It was in the scrapyard here on base. It had been returned, nobody wanted it. Ken and I were out there scrounging around like we would do, and we found it. And we knew that it had come from Whiteman. And at 11 o'clock one night, Ken and I loaded up my pickup, and we put it on our squadron commander's desk for him to see the next morning. So this was recovered, returned, and is now part of the museum. But this one actually flew, and that's that's how big it was. Okay. Now in the Titan system, the RV shroud stands about 16 feet high. It's a much bigger system. If you ever go down towards McConnell, there's an RV shroud on display at McConnell that was put there when the missile wing shut down, but it was much bigger. Roger told you how big the RV, the weapon was in this thing. In the Titan business, one weapon in the Titan business was equal to, exceeded the, the firepower of all of World War II, including the two bombs that were dropped. All the firepower. Do we, do we have a, a story of the Charlie Fire team? In their that, that, they were uh, on a uh, weapons convoy. They would have to take the, the missile boosters out back and forth to the site, and they had security. They had helicopters that would respond, be able to respond if anybody tried to attack it. Uh, the transporter, you see the big trailer out here, was, one of, was in the convoy. The helicopter, um, I don't know how it crashed, but it crashed and it killed all of them. The main all rotor disintegrated. <laughs> all the folks on board, including the pilots, and uh, Dave's been looking for pictures of the pilots, too, but he hasn't had time, but yeah, that's, uh, what, and, and that's today's 30, anniversary. 35 oh, wow. Years. That's why the helicopter is here on, on the site. That helicopter was, used to be over by base operations, it's been moved here, but that's a memorial to the Charlie Fire team and the two pilots from the helicopter detachment. They were on the helicopter itself? Yeah. Yeah. We, when we moved a reentry, when we moved a weapon from the base, the storage area, 
we had a convoy including federal marshals, highway patrol, county sheriffs, and two on-the-ground fire teams in armored vehicles. And then there was a helicopter support team that flew mm -hmm. air cover all the way. This accident took place down near Nevada. If you were here in the mid-80s, you might remember that going down. Those are the only known fatalities that ever took place in the years of the 351st Missouri. Today's their anniversary. Okay, real quickly, how they constructed these. And you can see this is basically one of the command centers being built. They did dig a huge hole down to the ground so they hit the bedrock of the earth around here. And it's about 45 feet down. They moved up put the foundations in, uh, brought in the capsule. We're going to be walking inside of this here in just a few minutes. Put capsule in, surrounded everything, rebar and concrete, covered it all back up, and then built the roof of the house. And the silo. This was a typical silo. Then it drilled down about 90 feet, straight down, put a steel tube liner in it, surrounded it with rebar, and this is a real good picture. And you all know what rebar is, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. And we also use a little bit of this. What's that? I don't know what that is. That's rebar. <laughs> that little piece of rebar weighs about 25 pounds. See how heavy it is? You got both hands on it? Wow. Now, as Roger's demonstrating okay. that, this missile wing was under construction in about 1962. Okay, those of us who are old enough remember that to be the what? Height of the Cold War, the Russian Sputniks, and all that was going on, and the Russians and the, and the Great Arms Race. Okay, Cuban Missile Crisis. Pre Cuban Missile Crisis. Was the Russian Navy during the Cold War? No, Korea. Korea. They started flying MiGs in Korea. However, here's what's interesting about this missile wing and the time and place that we found ourselves in. Okay, the um, 150 missiles and 15 control centers. Anybody want to take a guess how long it took us to build that? Start to finish. From the first shovel moved on this site until the wing was operational. Ten years. Less than a year. Two years, two months, and 12 days. Two years, two months, and 12 days. Now, we didn't have to deal with the EPA because it didn't exist. We also didn't have to deal with political agendas that didn't support national defense. There were 2,000 contractors working here laying 18, 17, 1800 miles of cable and did that 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two years, two months, and two day, 12 days. And they did it in a time frame where not only here, but other missile wings were being built. Okay, guys ready to go downstairs? And now we're Go downstairs. 